Let me just share a couple of things out of the news with you this week to kind of set up why the Lord laid this message upon my heart. This message was on my heart. And I had even mentioned to my wife, I think several weeks ago, that I wanted to come here and, and, and to this passage of Scripture and, and do this in a moment. Turn to the book of Psalms. Just cut your Bible in half and be there. I'll tell you which one in a moment. I'm not going to tell you now or else you're going to be reading it while I'm talking. I know how you are. I can't believe a bunch of Baptists that actually read their Bibles in church. <laughs> oh, goodness. But listen, this next one, it, it, it truly has, what I want to share with you is something much deeper and much more spiritual than the surface message of it. But it's been in mainstream media all this week and People have just, their heads are spinning because of it, and they're just reeling, and oh my gosh. So it's more, it's about the abject hypocrisy of it all, more than it is about politics or, or the whole COVID thing and the vaccines and all the different opinions on it. But it's, a, it's, it's an article that when I read it, I said, oh my gosh, right in front of the world, regardless of where one stands on their political view or their view on you know, the medical sciences and the mRNA and all of that. So, you know, all, all through the last several years, there's been all kind of debates and arguments and people getting kicked off social media and everything for questioning the speed, the rapidity at which the vaccine was brought forth and was it tested and all of that. And, and then, of course, the current administration and right down to we'll, you'll, you'll, you'll be fired if you don't take it and people with 100 employees or more, we're going to, you know, or if you're in the military, or if you're working for the airlines and all of these things. And people's lives were ruined, their careers were ruined, their, their jobs were ruined, some of them, their retirements were ruined and all of that has happened. That's just forget where you stand politically or even scientifically and medically and all of this. It's not the point of what I'm getting ready to make. I'm just reminding you of how it was and how it still is all over the world in various places and even in the United States and in some states even worse than others still. And so a lot of heat and pressure came down on the current administration because of all of this and still is. And now there are lawsuits that have been brought People against their employers, people against the airlines, people against the government, against the military. And so far, all the people that have come with these lawsuits have won their cases. Every one of them. Yeah, well, you can give the Lord a hand. So, so you know, I mean, it's not about the vaccine itself. Somebody wants to take it, take it. Do your research. If you, if you want to take it, take it. That's not the point. That's not the issue here. Here's the issue. So just this week, the headlines of major mainstream media said what some of us said six or seven months ago, just because it was common sense and just common sense and scientific sense, and we got kicked off social media for it. I have one account absolutely banned for life because I dared to say what the mainstream media is now declaring as truth. The hypocrisy is through the roof. The throwing of truth to the ground is unbelievable. All of these things, this obfuscation, the deception, the, the lying, the throwing, I just said it, throwing truth to the ground. That's because that's a biblical term. It's just in our face. So what has happened now? We've got an election coming up. Again, this is not political. I'm just saying that's all that's happened. Now we've got an election. So the news headlines this week, see, this is what makes Christians lose their minds. You know, and say, oh my gosh. And that's why I preached a couple of weeks ago about don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. The Bible says over and over, don't lose heart. We're here for a purpose. And this kind of junk that we're bathed in, that's why we're here. Can I get an amen? No, that's why we're here. So the headlines are now saying, it was Trump who developed the vaccine. Now, regardless of what you think about Trump, just think of the hypocrisy. He's the one that pushed it forward. He rushed it forward without even testing it. It's in, it's in, the, it's in mainstream media. He did, they, they didn't even test it properly. It wasn't even used on humans yet. This is mainstream media. Why? There's an election coming up, and now there seems to be a lot of problems with a lot of people, not everybody, but with a lot of people with the vaccine, et cetera. And some health problems. I mean, they've even got a name for it that's out there. Sudden adult 
death syndrome. That's been around for a while, but it's like the numbers are going higher and higher now with the correlation. Okay, it's just a correlation. And many people do just fine. But all of this that I'm saying is true, and it's in the media. And so now the headlines this week, it was Trump. It's Trump's fault. But wait, I thought you kicked me off social media because I said that several months ago. This should have been tested. It should have been tested long. It should have been used on humans massively, people that volunteered, et cetera, like we do all tests on all kinds of new drugs just to know what might happen. The point is, and I've said this before, and I'm going to say it here, and then we're going to move on, but I just want you to know this is the world that's driving people out of their minds. I said months ago, and I'll say it again, it's still true. There's not a single person on this planet that knows the final outcome of the effects of this vaccine. Not a single person. We're watching. We're still watching. We don't know. It wasn't tested on millions of human beings. It wasn't. It was developed, and nine months later, it was out. But now that there's some concern and some doubt and lawsuits are being won, now the mainstream media, just like that, we were right. <laughs> but they won't say it like that. Just like that. It's Trump's fault. He pushed it too quick. He didn't test it. He was forcing those vaccine manufacturers to rush something through. And, and we didn't use it on humans. And now, vote for us. <laughs> So we can fix it. Yeah, yeah. He did a real good job a little while ago. Okay, so there's all of that going on. And, I, and you know, in, in God's people, you know, they're just wandering through this, trying to do the best they can, and they're working with their doctors, and they're trying to read, and they're looking at their own health needs, and it's just like, oh, my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? And how is it that the media, you know, the information sources, and even governments go back and forth and back and forth continually? It'll drive you out of your mind. So also this week, the World Economic Forum Charles Schwab is kind of the big head, head deal of that, a huge globalist who's on record saying some outlandish, what would be biblically outlandish things about human population and human growth and how we're going to manage it in the future and all these things. And I don't want to get all deep into this this morning. I'm just telling you, this is in headlines this week, guys. This is not conspiracy theory stuff. You can go research this. Not while I'm preaching, please. Put your phones up. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, 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 but seriously, go back behind me and check it out. You'll see that I'm telling you the truth on all of this. But now he has come out and others have come out in the World Economic Forum this week breathlessly announcing that we're on the cusp of having implantable chips. Now, we've heard this for decades. But implantable chips that will, quote, change everything that will, quote, transform human life, quotes. Then you read the article. Here's this obfuscation, this deception again. And if you've got the Holy Spirit and you know how to read <laughs> and how to think, it'll slap you in the face like a wet dish rack because they say, you know, just like glasses or hearing aids improve our lives, up, 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 up. now we've got chips that can do something similar. Except when you read the article and you get down to the end of it, they're talking about brain implants that connect with computers, not just your computer, but with globalist computers to keep track. They, and, and, and they talk about children first, you know, because it's always they grab at our hearts. We can track every child. Nobody can ever steal a child again. And we can demand it can be a legal thing that we put these chips in children the moment they're born. And on and on and on. But don't, you know, we could cure disease and we could do, I mean, they put all the icing on it. But the bottom layer of the cake is, it's called, we've been talking about this for decades and people laughed at us. It's called transhumanism. It's where you take the human soul and body and you connect it to digital devices and you control or ma manipulate or um, uh, deceive the human that has this stuff. And then, of course, it's mixed with good, too. You know, what was it Satan told Adam and Eve? Eat of this tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good, oh, yeah, and evil. So when this thing came out and people jumped all over it, they saw what I'm telling you, what I just saw. I saw it, you know. 
I, and within a day or two, I get on the Internet. It's everywhere. People are saying, what? Did you read it to the end? Did you see what they're saying, what they're just saying in our face? If you just read the headlines or read the first few paragraphs, probably everybody in here, including myself, if that's all there was, I'd say, man, that's good. But you keep reading and you go, what? Putting it in kids when they're born and then their brains are connected to computers and on and on and on it went. And they're just saying, this is so wonderful. Okay. Those are just a couple things out of the headline news that just it makes God's people say, where are we going? Amen. Well, now see, we don't know that any of these things will, we, that first story I told you, which is an absolutely true story, we don't know how much traction it's going to get, how many people are going to believe it and, you know, use it to manipulate how they vote or what they think about our culture. I, I don't know. The second one, this dreamed of technology, which is now really out there and now it's being bragged about how we're going to use it, don't know that it'll ever get to use. We don't know what's going to happen, when, where, or how. Somewhere in the midst of this, the Lord returns for his children. We don't set dates here. We don't know when that's going to happen. We just know that most of the time when we see the mainstream media speaking of these things, it's almost like a grooming process. We're just being set up for what's to come. Which means that Christians continually ask, how do we deal with this? How do we live with this? How do we, man how do we maneuver our lives through this such that we can be witnesses for the Lord? Listen, I'll tell you a third story this week. You might have seen it in headline mainstream media. China, they've always been attacking underground church in China. We have connections with all of that. Here, our church. Our church does. I'm not going to say names and situations over the, over the air because this will go out before the whole world, and I don't want to put people in jeopardy, but we do. We have people intimate to us who are in those underground churches, and we've even shared stories with you, and they have, when they've come here, of almost being caught by the authorities and, and, and hiding in basements and various places for hours, for almost all day long, in total darkness and no air conditioning and all of those things. And this is what happens. This is how the church meets. Remember that next time you complain about the heating or the air here, okay? <laughs> yeah, I know some of you are saying, well, but Carl, you do that as much as the rest of us do. I know. We take so much for granted, don't we? Our safety, our relative peace, our ability to go out and share today and not worry about going to prison for it or... But just this week, there's a headline article that says, China liquidates major underground church. Well, when I hear the word liquidate, that means a couple of things. I mean, what would you do, go in and kill them all? Actually, that is a way to use that word. That's not what it meant, but that title was picked up, and it's all over the media now. What it meant was it basically shut it down completely, put the pastor in jail, the leaders in jail, <laughs> Uh, took the buildings, raided their bank accounts, took all their money, drove them into poverty, liquidated the whole thing. You know why? Because they're not a part of the official government church system where you have to register your names and where you work and all of your family and your children's names and where you go to church and and then you go to the official government churches, and they'll have a cross on them, some of them. Some cities made them take the crosses down. But there'll be a church on the corner, a big church. It looks rather more like a, you know, a, a big, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of it, and a more traditional kind of big building and, you know, very ecclesiastical looking. But what goes on inside, from what we know from people who know, uh, is that it's uh, all government messages. It extols the, you know, they'll use scriptures. I'm so glad our government officials don't use scriptures for their own. Aren't y'all? Like when they're running for office and they misquote scripture, can't even say the same of the name of the book. Unbelievable. <laughs> Just recently we had politicians say, my favorite verse comes from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, okay. You've already, another one a few, few decades ago says, my favorite verse is in the book of Galateans. Y'all remember that? I mean, it's just, God. well, in China, it's basically the same thing, except that when you go to these services, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff you hear. And, and, and a verse is picked out that basically tells you how you're supposed to obey the government, and usually it's out of context. And then there's some message from the 
you know, from the ruling authorities of the, of the city in which the, uh, the church is located. That's the church in China. The underground church is more like us. But they meet in secret, and they meet at the risk of losing everything. And they meet by the millions. And the cops are out trying to hunt them down every week. And from time to time, they catch one. Sometimes they get a big church like this one. That was in the news this week. So again, I just ask, where are we going? What's up? And how in the world do we deal with this? We're going to the Psalms this morning. Psalm 138. Turn there. Because you see, we immediately, when we see all this, when we look at this, we immediately think, of course, of spiritual warfare. Amen? Amen. I mean, we understand this stuff is demonic. The deception, the obfuscation, the lying, the duplicity, the abject hypocrisy, all of these things, the twisting of facts, the throwing of truth to the ground, the taking of good and twisting it just enough that it can be used for evil, all of these things have demonic influence and sometimes are absolutely demonically infested. The Word of God tells us that. And along with that comes this anxiety and fretting and even fear. And what was it that Paul told Timothy, the pastor there in, 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 um, in Ephesus more than likely? He says, but Timothy, listen, he says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Now, that sounds, that's a pretty verse. Those are pretty words. We can all say amen to it. But sometimes we overlook what those words mean. God has not given you a spirit. That word means demon, a demonic presence. A spirit of fear. Hebrews chapter 2 says that Satan's biggest power is to inflict and to manipulate all people with the fear of death. Have we seen something like that the last couple of years? I mean, all the time, but the last couple of years, we've all been immersed in it. Close down the churches, everybody's gonna die. You know, casinos can stay open though. Yeah, we've seen this stuff. God has not given you a demonic presence and overshadowing a, 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 a harassment of fear. God didn't do that. That comes from Satan's throne. He says, but rather God has given you the Holy Spirit of strength, of courage, of love, and of a sound mind. He says, stand in that. Now, why would he tell a pastor that spoken straight to the pastor? He didn't say, now, now, Timothy, teach this to the church. He said, Timothy, God has not given you. See, there was a pastor. Timothy, a young pastor. Things going on in the Roman Empire. They didn't have the technology we have now, but the same spirit has always been there, that same demonic antichrist spirit. And they were living in the midst of it in Rome, and the pastor was filled with fear. And Paul chastised him and reminded him, and eventually Timothy bucked up under it and became a man of God in a really powerful way. It would do well for us to remember that Satan hasn't changed his tactics. Human beings just pass through this world in front of him. We're just here 70 or 80 years, right? 90 if we're blessed, 100 if we're really blessed, and that's about it. Satan uses the same stuff, the same lies, the same tricks. Why would he do that? The same, the same reason fishermen use the same bait at the same time of year, everywhere, because we know they'll bite. Amen. Is everybody with me? So we know this is demonic. We know it's spiritual. Sometimes even God's people forget that it's spiritual. That's why Paul reminded the church... Your battle is not against flesh and blood. And I'm going to fill in some blanks here. Yes, I know you see it in flesh and blood. Yes, I know you deal with it in flesh and blood. Yes, I know sometimes we have to pull levers and vote, and it winds up with flesh and blood people in office that do flesh and blood things. He said, but our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against powers of darkness in the unseen realms. And then he says, therefore, you must be suited up for when the day of evil comes. And I've told you this before. The day of evil has been. There's been a, a day of evil in every generation. Sometimes in our lives, there are days of evil. Amen? <laughs> but that particular term used in that particular place speaks specifically of that day of evil in the very last days. In the most prophetic time since the first coming of Jesus Christ. To stand up against that 
onslaught, when technology is rampant and communication information systems are instantaneous, are ubiquitous and 24-7, in that day of evil, you got to be suited up with the armor of God. And that's truth and integrity and righteousness and the gospel of salvation. You know, know why you're here. Share that. Share the word. Walk in that. Praise, prayer. I mean, it's all there. That's how you do it. How is it? Because Satan can't stand praise. He can't stand. When you pray, you are touching the throne of God. You're getting power that now Satan has to deal with. See, I can't pull out a gun or a knife and attack Satan in the flesh. He can move through realms. But I can pray against him and touch the throne of God and have the power of my Jesus step in between and hold his hand up and say, you leave this one alone. Amen? I can sing praise songs and make Satan fall to his knees and go, stop! I can get in the Word and recite it and remember it and preach it and speak it and even say it to myself, even fall asleep at night quoting Scripture. I do that sometimes. And Satan again. Remember when he came to tempt Jesus in the wilderness? What did he do? He quoted Scripture, except he either misquoted it or didn't say the whole thing or misapplied it. That's what Satan knows Scripture. But when you start claiming the truth of God's Word, when you start speaking the truth in context and you speak it into Satan's kingdom, which is this, the prince of the power of the air, and you speak it before the throne of God, Satan hits his knees and clenches his ears and screams again, Stop! That's the armor of God. Always be ready. Have your feet shod with the gospel. Have your helmet of salvation on. That means just understand you're under the blood. You belong to God no matter what happens in this world. And some nasty stuff happens to God's people sometimes. But God has said to even you, I've got this and I'm going to make it right. And you win because you're on my side. That's what Paul was saying. You've got to have that perspective. Now, most of us know that passage of Scripture. But you know what's cool? That whole, that whole system of, that whole protocol of fighting the enemy, it's found literally, and I'm not misusing this word now, literally from Genesis to Revelation. It's, it's said over and over again in different words. What Paul says in Ephesians 6, it is said throughout the Word of God. Out of the mouth of God himself in the Old Testament. I've shown you before where God says, I put on the breastplate of righteousness. The Lord God goes forth with the sword of truth. The Lord God. I mean, it's like, that's what Paul was talking about. The armor of God. It's, it's all in there. Now I want to show you something really cool in Psalm 138. Because it just gives perspective. And it includes all of this. Different words, but it's the same concepts. The very same meaning. All right? To prove my point about reading the scriptures, I see about 30 of you doing it right now. All right, Psalm, <laughs> Psalm 138. I'm so glad you are, really. I'm glad you love the word. Psalm 138. Let's look at it together. Listen, I just, I'm just going to read it through. Then we're going to come back and kind of preach it and teach it through. Look, it, it just, it's a Psalm of David. He said, I will praise you, O Lord, with all of my heart. Before the gods I will sing. We'll come back to that. Your praise. I'll bow down toward your holy temple, and I will praise your name. For your love and for your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I called you, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing of the ways of the Lord. But the glory of the Lord is great, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly. But the proud, he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the work of your hands. That's a, first of all, that's a beautiful uh, psalm, isn't it? Isn't that beautiful? But wait till we get to the meaning of it all. It is absolutely astounding. I, praise you. I pray that you will come here often, especially in light of the way our world seems to be going. I praise you, O oh Lord, with all of my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. Pam, I'm going to ask you to clean my glasses, please. 
I do need to stop and explain some scripture here, but my gosh, I've had my hands all over them, and I'm up there going, I can't, what's next? I can't read this. Anyway, all right. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I praise you, Lord. And before the gods, I will sing. So first of all, let's just deal with this. What is praise, sing, music, this little light of mine to jazz music. <laughs> Y'all hear me? I will praise before, I will praise you. I will sing. But I love this before the gods. Now, y'all listen. Most of you know this. If you've read my book, Gods and Thrones, you, you, you know this. If you've been in any of the teaching we've done on Sunday nights, you know this. But we always have, always have guests by live stream and even in our congregation. And I want you to understand exactly what this means. It's gods with a little g. Before the gods. All right, what's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right. And I know some people, some people, in, unless you've been taught this and you know this and you know the context, a lot of people think, well, that just means like little statues and stuff like that. No, it doesn't. It means demonic ent entities. In Deuteronomy, where those commandments are given, God himself even says, and he's chastising him, he's chastising the people. He says, for they worship gods, little g, which are not even gods at all. They are demons. That's right out of the mouth of God himself. Because what we know is in the Hebrew, that word gods translates to Elohim. Now that's interesting. Because the first verse of the Bible in Hebrew says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. It's one of those words, it's like our English word deer. If I say, look, deer. Did I mean that I just saw a deer come in the door? Or did I see a hundred deer in the field? See, it's one word, and it can be plural or singular, and it depends upon the context. If I just say, look, deer, then you're a little confused. You don't quite know what I've seen yet until I say, look at those deer. I put the word those there. Now you know it's a, it's a herd. If I say, look at that deer, now I've put the context there. and you know, But it's the same word, deer. That never changes. Elohim's the same. What is it's the name of God. And, and, and it has the connotation of the creator of everything. In fact, that's why it's used that way in the very first verse. The creator, the all-powerful one, the one that speaks and calls something into existence. His most popular name in the Bible is Yahweh. It's found 7,000 times, although Elohim is found, I don't know, five, 6,000 times. It's the second most. And when you look in your Bibles, if, whenever you see a capital G-O-D, that's Elohim. See, in English, in the Old Testament, if you say, and God said... And then the, 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 when you look in your English Bibles and you see a capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's Yahweh, Lord, okay, God and Lord. If you see it, capital L and little O, R, D, that's for Adonai. See, because we, you know, it, it, they, they, they mean these things, but, but the, the, Hebrews, the Hebrew language has several different words. Sometimes you'll see the phrase, and the Lord God said, well, you know what that says, and Yahweh Elohim said, you see? Yahweh being the one and only, the great I am, I am. But Elohim being a little more of a personal name. I preached on that several weeks ago. We're in Ephesians chapter 3. The Word of God says, and then, then we're with him. He's, he's giving his name to his family in heaven and to his family on earth. You remember that? And that is the sons of God, B'nai Elohim, the sons and daughters, the children of God himself. We get to have his name on us. We belong to Elohim. Isn't that cool, guys? So this is what David is saying as he is doing spiritual battle every day in his world. He says, first of all, I'm going to get up and I'm going to sing and I'm going to praise. But now watch. You can speak of the righteous Elohim, the angels around God's throne. Earthly speaking, you can speak of God's people who are under the blood and with the Holy Spirit born again. We take his name, B'nai Elohim. But also, when it's used like the first commandment, have no other gods before you. And then God himself says, these are not gods. You know, they think they are, but they are demons, and they're trying to pretend like they're gods in front of you. That's why Paul writes in Corinthians, he says, you know, Satan himself even appears, even plays the game of being an angel of light. Yeah, he wants you to just be totally overwhelmed by him and how wonderful he is, and he will masquerade as an angel of light. Is everybody with me? So when, now this is important. I said all that to say this. 
when we come together and we sing praise and when these instruments play and our voices, which are instruments, when our instruments are declaring the praise of God and the song of God and the worship of God and the drums are beating and the piano's going and the organ is going and the guitars are blaring and, and, and the trumpet is blowing and the violins are playing and, and we are singing, Satan hates that. He hates it. Not only that, but we are literally doing it before the gods, both the angels in heaven around the throne. There's something interdimensional there. I've preached on this so much, it'll take me another hour now. I've written to it. I've preached on it. I've showed you in the Bible. Everything is interdimensional, beginning in Genesis and ending in Revelation. We understand that. Those of us that have been under this teaching and word, we, we know that. So, and I, that's why sometimes when I'm up here leading, helping to lead in worship, I will say something about sing with the angels, join the angels, join the, uh, the angels around the throne. Let's sing this. How great is our God? How great is his name? What are we doing? Interdimensionally, we are connecting. It's like prayer. When we pray, what are we doing? We're interdimensionally speaking to the throne of God. And the only way we have access to that is we're under the blood. We have the Holy Spirit in us. If we can take a little black box, put it in our hand or our back pocket, and connect with somebody on the other side of the world, can't God put a chip in us, a biological chip, to connect us with his throne when we're under his Holy Spirit? Y'all give the Lord a hand. Please help me out. Can't he do that? Of course he can. And David, 3,000 years ago, writes about this truth. 3,000 years ago, he says, I will get up and I will sing my praise. I will make my music. I will, do, I will make my songs and I will do it in the presence of the gods. I'll join with the angels in heaven and I'll do this to Satan while I'm singing about God's grace and his mercy and his deliverance and his strength. Amen? Amen. Now that's a piece of spiritual armor. That's what the church is called to do right now. That's why I'm always telling you, don't take for granted what we're doing here on Sunday mornings. And it's easy I, I, to do that. I use the word we <laughs> because I'm just as susceptible to you as, you know, Saturday night going to bed and saying, okay, I'm going to be in church and I can't wait to preach. And we get here and I just assume it's all going to be here and folks are going to be here and assume the law hasn't got troops out front and guns and ready to take me to prison. I mean, I just assume that. Don't you guys just assume that? So we take a lot for granted. We. And what I'm saying is part of the spiritual armor that is so important to us. Do you have my glasses? I can get them back. Yeah. I just think I'm going to go read the word about how am I going to do that. Okay. So part of the spiritual armor is singing before the gods with the angels. Revelation chapter 4 and 5, that beautiful scene of the throne room of God, 10,000 times 10,000 angels singing. The apostle Paul saying, your mind cannot conceive what lies ahead. Your, your eyes have never seen the things you're getting ready to see. Your ears have never heard. Can you imagine 10,000 times 10,000? And that's probably just an estimation for something much larger. But that's 100 million. Can you imagine a hundred million people singing this song, How Great Is Our God? A hundred million harps playing. A hundred million, the living creatures around the throne, all of them built with musical instruments as a part of their body, according to Ezekiel 28. And they're singing and they're leading in worship. And, you know, and, you know we, we, in, in our modern day technology, you know, we got the rap guys up there, boom, boom, boom. And then we've got the, we've got the, um, uh, the uh, acapella guys that make their voices and their bodies sound like instruments. They beat on their chest. They move their voices a certain way. And you think it's an instrument. You say, where are the, I thought they were acapella. It is. It's their voices. And we're fallen. We live in a sinful, fallen world. Can you imagine around the throne of glory and, 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 and the living creatures that are huge and God made them and they're worship leaders and they surround the throne and a hundred million angels and, and those saints in glory that have gone before us, they're singing and the harps are playing. Can you imagine? Paul said, you cannot imagine it. So what do we do here? I can't do that. Yeah, you can. You can use your voice. You can speak, if you can't sing, you can speak the words. You can pray the words. Because you connect before the throne of God. Is everybody with me? Yes. This is how Paul starts, I mean, this is how David starts this. He says, first of all, I'm going to get up. I'm going to praise. 
and I'm going to sing before, oh, this is so much, I can see. It's like my vision is a miracle. I can see. All right. I, I was wondering, I said, man, I'm just going blind. And then it dawned on me, it might need, my glasses might need cleaning. Now I know. This is great. Thank you, baby. Miracle worker over there. All right, watch this. I will praise you, O Lord, with all of my heart. See, there's something soul and heart and mind connected. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. That is, before the angels in heaven, and yes, even before the fallen ones, before the demons, before the demonic hosts and Satan himself, I will praise Jesus. That way Satan knows whose side I'm on. Are y'all watching me? Now, are you hearing me, I mean? I don't care if you watch me or not. Do you hear me? That's just a southern thing. Y'all watching me? All right. But the deal is, guys, listen to me. Please don't take this for granted. This is throughout the Bible, culminating in the book of Revelation, but right in the middle of this Ephesians 6 declaration of this, but it's throughout the Word of God when you sing your praises to Jesus Christ and lift Him up, and we join our voices together especially, and when we sing and celebrate, and if you feel like clapping your hands, that's biblical, that's there. If you want to shout every now and then, that's biblical, that's in there. I'm, I'm telling you guys, even you want to do the Baptist dance and tap your foot, I mean, that, that's in the Bible. They dance, they sang, they clap, they praise. Why? They knew they were doing battle. They were doing battle. They weren't just seeing who had the prettiest voice. They were singing into the presence of the angels with them, the hundred million and the living creatures, and they were singing into the face of the demonic realm. That's the power, and Satan can't stop it. You hear me? I can pull out my knife or my gun and say, Satan, step out of that closet. He ain't coming out. He, he, he's laughing at me. But I can start singing and praising to Jesus, and I can join my voice with yours, and there ain't nothing Satan can do about it, and it hurts his heart when we do it. Are y'all following me? It's all through the Word. I just wanted you to see it right here in the Psalms. These Psalms this Psalm is 3,000 years old, and the same stuff out of Ephesians 6 is repeated all the way through this. I'm going to show it to you. Watch. So we've just started. I'll praise you, O Lord, with my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple. Now, let me explain that. That confuses some people. Well, why would he do that? I mean, that's like what, you know, other religions do. No, no, no. There was no temple in Jerusalem when David said that. He didn't build the temple. He was dead when the temple was built by his son. There was no temple. Now, one thing David did do, and people don't know exactly when this was written, so, but he did restore the tabernacle and brought the ark back. He might have meant that just as, an, as, as another symbol of his honor to the Lord, to the tabernacle, to the word of God, to the person of God, to his holy meeting place. Could have meant that, but I'm going to tell you what I think. And a lot of scholars agree with this, so I'm not just pulling this out of my back pocket. It doesn't mean they're right, and it doesn't mean I'm right, but I'm just saying, think on this. We read in Hebrews 2, um, excuse me, in the book of Hebrews, a very great truth. It's speaking of the temple that's on the Temple Mount when Jesus was crucified. And then it talks about Jesus entering into the heavens when he was ascended and bringing his blood into the real temple in heaven that says is the real thing, just everything on the Temple Mount, the book of Hebrews says, is just a shadow. It's a copy of what's really behind the curtain. Is everybody with me? So for David to use this terminology of I bow down, it would be similar to the way we might worship now, either on our knees or standing, raising our hands in worship, and we're, it doesn't matter which way we're pointing, we're saying... We're connecting with the temple of God, with the throne of God, his holy dwelling in all of the angelic realm and the saints and glory that are surrounding that throne. I bow down towards your holy temple. Remember, David had no concept of an actual building temple on the temple mount. Oh, he wanted to do it, but God said no. So he wasn't bowing down to something that wasn't there. He was bowing down to what he knew. There was something behind the veil something behind the curtain, something in that other dimension that sealed off from us since the Garden of Eden. And he bowed down and he sang his praise and he lifted up his song into the presence, into the face of the angels of heaven and to the gods who are not gods but demons. Amen? I want you to get this. What was he doing? He's worshiping. He's on his knees. He's lifting his hands. He's praising. He's singing. 
He says, and I will bow down and I will praise your name. We'll talk about that in a moment because it said again, for your love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things. How many is all? Say it with me. All. You have exalted above all things. What? What does it say right there? Your word and your name. I'm telling you guys, over and over the word of God says that. Over and over we're told that it's the word and the name, the word and the name. The word and the name. Sometimes it's said in different ways. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 has said, And they, God's people, overcame Satan, overcame him by the word of their testimony. That comes right out of the word, their salvation. And by the blood of the lamb. Who's the lamb? It's Jesus. What's his name? Yeshua HaMashiach. The word and the name. They overcame him by the word and the name. You see, that's there. It's everywhere. Way back in the beginning of Revelation, in chapter 2, the church at Philadelphia. I've prayed that prayer. I've preached this sermon over this church for the 35 years we've been together, not knowing that these days were coming in our lifetime. But I kept praying. I said, I want to be the church at Philadelphia. What was the defining characteristic of the church at Philadelphia? It says, because you have not been ashamed of my name, Jesus is saying this, and because you have stood in my word faithfully, and because you have stood up against the false teachers, I'm going to use that now without having to define every word in there. He says, here's my gift to you. I will keep you. I will preserve you in the midst of the trial that's coming upon the whole earth. I've been praying that for 30 years over this church. We had horrible demonic attacks the first, couple, the first decade that, that we were here together. Oh, it wasn't every day and it wasn't every time. There were so many good people here, good godly people. We stood together and we just kept doing what was right. And here we are 36 years later. And we're all over the world ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. What has God done? We've stood in his word. We've exalted his name. We fought the battles against the falseness and the fakeness and the evil that came. We fought it. We stood. And look what God has done. 36 years later, he's preserved us in the midst. And even now... Even now, that hand is for you, O Lord Jesus. But even now, in the midst of it, even now, where we're headed, and I have a feeling it's going to get a little worse around the world. Don't know about right here or right here where we live, but it's going to get worse, guys. Yet, if we stand in his name, and we're not ashamed of it, we stand in his word, and that becomes our worldview. And we sing his praises into the face of, of the demonic realm, and we sing his praises along with the Elohim around the throne. It robs power from Satan, and it gives us power. Over and over through the scriptures, we're told these things. I will continue to pray that prayer and preach that sermon over this church from, Revel from Revelation, the church at Philadelphia. Look at this. Verse 3. And when I called, you answered me, and you made me bold and stout-hearted. Did you get that? When I sang your praises, when I lifted up my voice in song, when I joined with the instruments, when I joined with my brothers and sisters, when I stood in your word, when I spoke your name, when I claimed your word, when I claimed your name, you answered my prayers, and you gave me strength and courage because God does not give us a demon of fear. He gives us a demon of power and of love and of a sound mind. Do you see how all this fits together, guys? It's like the word actually fits together <laughs> from Genesis to Revelation. Don't lose heart. Well, how do I get strength and courage? We, we, we haven't even finished this psalm yet, but there's a bunch of it right there. Sing his name. Praise his name. Understand and you're see it in your mind's eye, and I'm not talking about you know po power of positive thinking and you know and and just envision this. And if you see it, you can do it. I, I'm just talking about what God's word says. Look in your mind, the glimpses of glory. Understand as you're singing, the angels are singing with you. That's a promise of God's word. You're singing with them. How do you know when you just start singing a song that they weren't already singing it, and the Holy Spirit led you to join in with them? How do we know? 
The Word of God says all of those things can happen. All of those things are spoken of in God's Word. So we sing, we join in song, we stand in the Word, we exalt His name, and God hears and He answers. It's almost like, I mean, a loving Heavenly Father and our little child runs up to, I mean, a loving father or grandfather and our little child or grandchild runs up, Daddy, Daddy, Papa, Papa. We can't help but to answer them, right? Right? It's almost like God can't, but can't help but to answer us, to hear us and to answer us. When we've exalted his name, when we're singing to him, I love you, my heavenly father who is in heaven, holy is your name, is like, wow, we've got his attention. And then we praise him and we ask him and we go to his word and we claim his promises and he, and he can't help but to answer us. And that's what David says. He says, and when I do this, God hears and he answers and he gives me strength and he gives me courage to stand. All right, we keep reading. And then he breaks into this. This is like a song of praise right here, but it speaks to biblical truth. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord. When they hear the words of your mouth, may they sing of the ways of the Lord for the glory of the Lord is great. I mean, that's like a song right there. May the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord. When they hear the words of your mouth, may they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. That kind of goes along with, and on that day every tongue will confess, every knee will bow that Jesus Christ is Lord. The kings of the earth will bow before him. It kind of goes to the prayer that Jesus taught. How do we pray? You pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in that day, the kings of the earth will bow. That's what Paul's talking about. He, I mean, I'm David, I was talking about Paul before in Ephesians, but now David is, is saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in rapturous glory. He got a glimpse of glory here. He sees the throne of God. He sees that when he sings, he's joining the angels, the sons of God, the gods. He also sees that he's disturbing the demonic realm, and he's drawing strength and power from that. God's giving him that because he doesn't have the human power to go up against Satan. And the demonic, he knows that. It's another dimension. But he knows what to do to get this strength and this power. And then that overwhelms him in his worship. And he sees it. He can see it in his spiritual mind's eye. And he connects with it. And it gives him strength and power. And then he even sees basically out into the future where he understands and knows even the kings. And he's one of them. But the godless kings, the ones that have rejected his name, they will one day bow and speak his name and praise his name, and they will give him the glory that is and the honor that is due him. Isn't that amazing? Give the Lord a hand of praise there. So that's the glimpse. All right, but watch. Let's keep going. Now, though the Lord is on high, he looks upon the lowly. That word means the humble. That is, that's speaking of those that know him, those that humbly came to him, called upon the name of Jesus in our day, gets under the blood, the humble, those that say to the Lord, Lord, we're willing to learn from you, from your word. That's, that's what humility means, a willingness to learn, a willingness to come to the Savior. He says the Lord looks upon those. He looks upon from on high. He looks upon the lowly, the humble, his children, but the proud, that is those who have arrogant liars, rejecting him, making fun of us, attacking us, it says he knows them from afar. In other words, he knows them, but they are so far from him. His hand of grace and mercy and protection is not on them, but it is upon those that are humble before him. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's part of the spiritual armor, humility before the Lord, the blood, the name, the word, the singing, the songs, the praise. And then, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. Now, that can mean, that has several branches of meaning. I, I would say that most of God's people are somehow, in some way, walking in the midst of trouble today. How about you? I mean, we're walking in the midst of it. It may not be actually impacting us today. But we are walking in the midst of it. It's everywhere. Trouble, evil, lies, deception, truth thrown to the ground, hypocrisy. We're walking in the midst of it. And what is God's promise when all of this is a part of your life right here? 
And see, all of this is not, it's not, not some magic formula. It's not magic stuff. I mean, it's just stuff we ought to be doing, stuff that we encourage each other to do all the time. Sing, praise, prayer. Get your eyes on Jesus, right? That's all that David's saying here. And he said, and so when you walk in the midst of trouble, God preserves your life. doesn't mean you'll not leave this earthly world in physical death or that you'll never get sick or that never. It doesn't mean that. It just means in the midst of it, he will have his hand on you. And even in the midst of this fallen world, if some of the travails fall upon you, his presence is in you in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that the world can't understand. The peace of God that transforms all understanding will will guard you and protect you. Philippians 4 and many other scriptures. Here it is said again. I think you're seeing the pattern here, but let's keep going. This is cool. So though I walk in the midst of trouble, because I have been singing to you, I've been praising you, been playing my instrument if I know how, I've been worshiping, I, 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 I've, I've, I've stood in your word, I've exalted your name, I've seen glimpses of glory of the kings of earth eventually bowing down before you. I know you win, and so I win. So now I'm walking in the midst of trouble, and even there you're preserving my life. I'm alive today. I'm in church today. I'm singing your praise. Praise God you're preserving me. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes with your right hand hand you save me the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me your love O Lord endures forever do not abandon the work of your hands in other words Lord just thank you for what you're doing keep on doing it until the day I'm with you but you see let me look at this again I want to show you something really cool something I think the Holy Spirit showed me he says look at verse 7 though I walk in the midst of trouble you preserve my life even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil. You stretch out your hand against the angers of my foes, and your right hand you save me, and even in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table before me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O oh Lord, endures forever, and I am sure that your grace and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and then I will get to live with you in your presence forever and forever and forever. Do you see that? The Word of God says the same thing over and over from Genesis to Revelation. It's just we land upon places like Ephesians 6 where it's just like black and white in our face. This takes a little bit more understanding and it's a little bit more poetical and almost like a song, but it's there. The same formula is there. It's not a secret formula. It's not a magic hoodoo thing. It's just praise and worship, standing in the Word, standing on His name, joining in fellowship with others, keeping our eyes on the Lord, having glimpses of glory, understanding we are connecting with the literal throne of God. When we're in His Word, when we're in praise, we are also sticking our finger literally in Satan and the demon's eyes when we do this. This is our battle. Paul says it again in, in 2 Corinthians. He says, look, our weapons of war are not as human weapons of war. Our weapons of war are spiritual. We fight with spiritual weapons. And he says, and so we stand up against every vain thing that sets itself up against the glory of God. We stand up in the name of Jesus against that. In other words, we bring everything that Satan throws at us in the spiritual, everything that he puts fear in our heart, he puts doubt in our mind. We take that vain thought that Satan's put there and we say, I reject that in Jesus' name. Get under the blood of Jesus. God, put me under your blood. Get that thought out of my mind and out of my heart. It's a vain thought. It's a nasty thought. It's a demonic thought. And boom, it has to go under the name of Jesus. It has to. And then you start singing praise songs. And then you go to the Word or either start quoting some scripture that you know. Even if you think it doesn't fit the moment, just quote it. It doesn't matter. It's God's Word. It'll wind up fitting the moment you watch. Are you hearing me? It's everywhere through the scriptures. We live in crazy, stupid days, guys. Every day is another circus act. Every day is another clown show. Every day. And whenever you stop and think, what's going on with the world? It's been given over to a depraved mind. Romans 1. It's falling apart. What is it really doing? It's coming together. Just like as God's word has said. 
Yeah, it's falling apart, yeah. But, but we don't look at it that way. We say, man, everything's coming together. <clears throat> Just like God's Word said. And the world still denies what God's Word said. There's no other religious, I'm putting quotes around it, word in the world that says the things that this Word says that have all come true and or are coming true right now before our eyes and all through history. Not another one. Not another one. For that reason alone, I'm going to stand right there. But I also know because of Jesus and the cross and empty tomb and everything else, I'm standing right there. How about it, Lord? How about it, folks? Give the Lord a hand of praise. All right? So, so there you are. But now watch this, and I'm going to wrap it up. Watch this. That's Psalm 138. It's like if you could take the psalm title numbers and, and the verses away, and you just kept reading Psalm 139 just falls right in there and pumps it up on steroids. See, so you're reading Psalm 38. I'm going to praise you in the morning. I'm going to sing in the morning. I, I'm going to love you. I'm going to, I'm going to stand in your word. I'm going to stand in your name. This is how I'm going to do battle. And when I do that, you hear me and you answer me. I'm like your child. You're my heavenly father. And oh my gosh, I just got a glimpse of glory. I can see the day when all the kings are going to bow down in front of you. I can see it coming. But in the meantime, you preserve my life. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says here, even though I walk through evil, even though I walk in times of trouble, you are there. You preserve my life, and then surely goodness and mercy will follow me. He says here, and surely you are there, and you are taking care of me, and then I'm going to be with you forever and ever, and then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And then Psalm 139, I'm just going to paraphrase it because we're going to get out of here. it take another hour to preach that. Okay, you four people, please stay. All right, no, no but watch. Look, 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 Psalm 139. And I'm just paraphrasing, so I'm going to miss some of it, and I'm not going to quote it precisely, but the message is true. And it starts off by saying, Oh, Lord, where, how, who are you? How, who am I? How, I can't even hide from your presence. I mean, you, you're there. You're there all the time. You're there. You know, he's speaking of somebody that loves him. He says, You're there. You, you, you know me. You, you know me from afar. Isn't that what David just said? He, you know, he knows everybody from, a, from afar for sure. But, but those that know him and are in humility, he brings them close to his heart and he knows them. He says, you know me. He says, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. It's almost like the psalmist knew something about airplane flight in the future. I'm kidding, but I do fly a lot. And I think about that. When I'm up there, I'm thinking, Lord, you're even here. Praise God, you're even here. 35,000 feet in the air. You're even here. Praise God. And then it says, and, though, and if I made my bed in the depths, we talked about this Monday night. We've, we've got uh, a couple of guys in our church here that served in submarines in the, in, in the military, submariners. And, I, and, I, and, and, and one of them particularly, Chuck, a good friend of mine, Chuck DeWiggins, he was on a submarine. And, and I asked him in men's Bible study, I said, so when you went to bed at night, you were making your bed in the depths, right? He says, was God there? He said, oh, yes. <laughs> He said, a lot of praying going on in those days. You understand, in the Psalms, talk about these things. Even if, even if I'm making my bed, even if I'm in the air, if I'm way above the earth, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. Psalm 139 says that. And then he goes on and said, who can hide from you? Even, even before a word is on my tongue, you know it full well. That's really cool, isn't it? And scary too, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes, well, well, I didn't say it. I was thinking it, so I didn't sin. Well, the Lord knew it. <laughs> Before it's on my tongue, you know it full well, but I love this. Then he says, and you knew me even in my mother's body, in her womb, before I was developed you knew me. You called me my name. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And all of the days ordained for me were written in your book before the first one came to be. And so what our reaction to that should be, oh, my gosh, God is so big. Well, the next verse says, who can know the mind of God? His thoughts are like the grains of sand. And then this is what I love, and this is what David is saying. And when I awake, that's a Hebrew euphemism for when I die, but then I open my eyes. And when I awake, I am still with you. Amen. There you are. The one that knit me together in my mother's womb. The one that allowed me to touch his throne in prayer. The one that heard my songs when I sang them and the angels sang with me. 
the one that preserved me as I was walking through the valley of the shadow of death and didn't even see the wolves up on the mountains looking down at me. I didn't even see them, but you saw them, and you took care of me. You fed me in the midst of that. You anointed my head with oil. You filled my cup till it overflowed. In other words, you just blessed me and blessed me, even when the wolves were salivating all around me, and I didn't even see them. Surely that kind of grace and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And the inference of David's psalm is, if, you'll, if this will be your life. If you're not ashamed of his name, if you'll stand in his word, Amen. sing those songs, come in here on Sunday mornings. We're, this is a singing church. I love it. I love it. I mean, every now and then you'll hear Pastor Jimmy, you know, he's leading and he'll just stop his voice. He's doing that because he just likes listening. I know I've talked to him about it before. He just likes to hear you sing. This church sings. That's amazing. And some of y'all, we really would rather you didn't. But, but, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm teasing. Make a joyful noise. Sing. And if for some reason you just don't want to, at least speak the words in prayer to the Lord. I mean, join with it. Don't say, well, I can't sing, so I'm not going to sing. Don't, no, no, this is God's word. Put the music and, and, and praise. And, and, and so join in because this is a part of our protection. This is a part of our strength. This is a part of what God does for us. And we literally, spiritually, literally join join with the gods, with the angels, and then we stick our fingers in the face of Satan, the one that's been messing with us all week long, messing with our minds, messing with our bodies, messing with our families, our children, our grandchildren. You're sticking your finger in his face. And then you walk through this life and all that it brings, and God preserves, he protects, he guides, his Holy Spirit directs, and at the end of it all, we close our eyes. If we're not raptured out of here first, we close our eyes in what the world calls death, but we open them, and there he is. He is still with us. Give the Lord a hand of praise. This is the promise of his word from beginning to end. This is stuff you can sink your teeth into. This is why I stand in a biblical worldview. I don't go along with the social constructs that change with the shifting sand. I build my house on the rock. I'm going to endure when that day of flood comes. In the meantime, everything we're doing this morning, this is just a rehearsal for when we get around that throne. I'm looking at the faces of people I know and love and people I know and love that I, I feel in my heart. I can't pronounce salvation on anybody, but I feel in my heart that you know and love Jesus too. I'm looking into some faces I'm just getting to know and I don't really know and I'm not your judge anyway. I'm looking into faces I don't know yet. So I don't know where everybody is stand spiritually, but I pray that I get to look into all of your faces when one day we awake and we are around that throne. And we watch the kings bow down and call his name. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't want to do it in agony and shame. I want to start right now doing it in praise and worship. That is my strength. I pray it is yours as well. Have you ever wanted to experience deep and glorious truths in God's Word from Genesis to Revelation as if you were actually there? In this incredibly unique book, Glimpses of Glory, from longtime pastor, media personality, and internationally acclaimed best-selling author Carl Gallup's God's love for you will come alive as you walk directly into the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve encountered the great tempter. You'll be placed inside the ark experiencing the horror of Noah's family as they heard the agonizing cries of their neighbors struggling in vain to survive the deluge. And the anguish of our Savior will explode into intense reality as you witness his struggle with human emotion on the night he was betrayed. But that's just the beginning. In Glimpses of Glory, you will accompany Joseph and Mary on the arduous journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem's manger and beyond. Be present at the working of Jesus' miracles, His baptism, and labor during the wilderness temptation. Stand in shock at the foot of the cross. Linger at the deathbed of John the disciple and witness His entrance into final glory and so much more. So take a personal journey with the Savior from Genesis to Revelation. Available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order now or call 1-844-750-4985.